Hello, I'm Sean Gabb. I teach Latin, Greek and Classics. In this video, I will try to explain the meaning and the use of the Latin declensions. If you are a beginner in Latin, and if English is your first language, and particularly if English is your only language, you may find these difficult to understand. You may find them difficult so far as Latin nouns are given so many different endings, all of which must be committed to memory. You may also find them difficult so far as they are used to express relationships between words that in English are expressed by the order of words within a sentence or by a heavy use of prepositions. Latin and English are radically different languages and each does the same things in different ways. To explain how Latin works, I will begin with what every student already knows about English, even if what is known is known only unconsciously and then apply this to Latin. Let us begin by looking at these two short and simple sentences in English. Marcus kills Sextus and Sextus kills Marcus. Their meanings are different but equally clear. In the first, Sextus is being killed by Marcus. In the second, Marcus is being killed by Sextus. There is no possible doubt of their meaning. But to see how their meaning is so plain, let us look at the grammar behind them. In an English sentence, there will normally be three main parts, without which the sentence may not in itself make sense. There is a subject, there is an object, and there is a verb. The subject is the person or thing that is acting. Marcus kills Sextus. Because Marcus is the one who is killing, Marcus is the subject. The object is the person or thing that is being acted upon. Marcus kills Sextus. Because Sextus is the one being killed, Sextus is the object of the sentence. The verb is the doing word, and you shouldn't need me to say anything about that. So here we have the sentence, Marcus kills Sextus, a sentence containing a subject, a verb, and an object. How do we know that Marcus is the subject of this sentence, and that Sextus is the object? The answer is that, generally speaking, in English, the subject comes before the verb and the object comes after the verb. Therefore, Marcus is the subject because it comes before the verb kills and Sextus is the object because it comes after the verb killed. If we change the order of the words in the sentence so that Sextus kills Marcus, we change the meaning of the sentence. Sextus, because he comes before kills, is now the subject. Marcus, because he comes after kills, is now the object. To see how this works in Latin, let us continue with the sentence Marcus kills Sextus. In Latin, the position of the words in a sentence is much less important than how the words end. Look at this. Marcus necat sextum. Both names are masculine nouns of the second declension. When used as a subject, a name will end us. When used as an object, a name will end um. In this sentence, therefore, we know that Marcus is killing Sextus not from the position of the words in the sentence, but from the endings of the words. Indeed, let us rearrange the sentence. Marcus sextum necat. This is closer to the normal order of words in a Latin sentence, so far as there is any normal order. If we place the verb at the end, it is still Marcus who is killing Sextus. Or let us rearrange again. Sextum Marcus necat. You may do this because you like the sound of the new arrangement, or to emphasise that it is Sextus whom Marcus is killing but the underlying meaning is unchanged. 
change the order in an English sentence of subject and object, and you change the meaning of the sentence. Change the order in Latin, and the underlying meaning is the same. Nothing so far should be unusual to an English speaker. Latin is what is called an inflected language. English, on the whole, is not. Note, however, the qualification, on the whole. Until about a thousand years ago, English was an inflected language. It was, in its structure, rather like Latin. Most of its inflections have faded away over the centuries, but some remain. Look at this. I hit her. She hit me. Her hit I. Me, she hit. These last are strange sentences, and you might think anyone using one of them to be a foreigner imperfectly instructed in the English language, or a person somewhat affected in his utterance. But there can be no doubt that the sentences all make sense. They make sense because where the personal pronouns are concerned, English retains separate forms that do not require a fixed order of words. I is subject, her is object. She is subject, me is object. Therefore, her hit I is a strange way of saying I hit her. Me she hit is again a strange way of saying she hit me. English, therefore, retains a limited number of forms that can be made an example for learning the use of the Latin declensions. Now, Latin does not confine itself to expressing differences between subject and object. Meanings and distinctions that we express in English through the position of words or by placing prepositions in front of words are expressed in Latin by using a series of terminations. To see how these work, let us again take the name Marcus, which, as said, is both a name and a masculine noun of the second declension. There are five, or perhaps six, of these declensions, and each has both singular and plural forms, but we shall take only masculine nouns of the second declension and only the singular forms. Here they are. Nominative, Marcus. Vocative, Marque. Accusative, Marcum. Genitive, Marci. Dative, Marco. Ablative, Marco. These being given, let us see what each part of this declension means. The nominative case is used to express the subject of a sentence or clause. Examples. Marcus ferox est. Marcus is fierce. Marcus juvenis est. Marcus is a young man. Marcus juvenis ferox est. Marcus is a fierce young man. The nominative is used for the person or thing that is taking action. The vocative case is used for speaking to someone. Examples. Non amo te, Marque. I do not like you, Marcus. Ite domum, Marque. Go home, Marcus. Marque ubi es. Marcus, where are you? you? You will see in your grammar that every noun of whatever declension has a vocative. In a sense, it has, just as they have in English, I suppose. However, only masculine nouns of the second declension have a particular form for the vocative, and only in the singular. You might translate any of these sentences as O oh, Marcus, or you might not. The accusative case has many uses, but is perhaps most often used to express the object of a sentence or clause. Examples. In horto Marcum conspicet Sextus. Sextus notices Marcus in the garden. Sextus Marcum non amat. Sextus does not like Marcus. Sextus Marcum timet. Sextus fears Marcus. 
In these examples, the accusative case is used to express the object of a sentence or clause. The accusative here is used for the person or thing that is being acted upon. In English, we express the genitive by using an apostrophe and s, or by putting the preposition of in front of the noun that is possessing something. In Latin, there are particular forms. Examples. Pater Marci Senex Est. The old man is the father of Marcus. In Manu Marci Nihil Vidit. He saw nothing in Marcus's hand. The genitive case is used to show that someone or something possesses something. It has other related uses. The dative case expresses the indirect object of a sentence. Examples. Senex gladium Marco dedit. The old man gave a sword or the sword to Marcus. Cenam Marco paravit. He prepared dinner for Marcus. In English, we use two or four to show the indirect object of a sentence. In Latin, as ever, there is a particular form. Oh, and note the ambiguity of whether the old man is giving a sword or the sword to Marcus. In Latin, unlike in English, unlike in Greek, and unlike in many modern languages, there are no articles. There are no words for the or for a. Therefore, when you are given a, a Latin sentence like senex gladium marco dedit, it is up to you to guess whether he's giving a sword or the sword, or to find out whether he's giving a sword or the sword by looking at the context of the whole passage. The ablative was originally a case for expressing separation from something. By the classical period, it incorporates two other cases, the instrumental and the locative. After the nominative, it may be the case most often used in a Latin sentence. Here are some of its uses, and we shall continue the rather sad story emerging in these slides. A Marco Necatus est Sextus. Sextus was killed by Marcus. Here, Marcus is the personal agent. And, and now we move away from examples directly affecting wicked Marcus. Sextus vulnere mortuus est. Sextus died from a wound. Here the ablative is used to express a cause. Sextus marcum gladio necavit. Sextus killed Marcus with a sword. An instrumental use. De sexto multa fabula Marcus narrat. Marcus tells many stories about Sextus. Reference. Light your sexto Marcus est. Marcus is happier than Sextus. The ablative of comparison. Lightus est Marcus necatu sexto. Marcus is happy. Sextus having been killed. Th this last is an example of the ablative absolute. This is a kind of subordinate clause, and you would normally translate it as Marcus is happy having killed Sextus, or even Marcus is happy because he has killed Sextus. But Latin has a shortage of active past participles, and so a passive past participle needs often to be used. Why the clause is put in the ablative case would require a longer description than I wish to give here, but ablative absolutes are very common in Latin and very useful. Let us return to the full list of cases. Marcus. Marcus. Marce. Marcum. Marci. Marco. Marco. You will have noticed that the dative and ablative forms of Marcus are identical, Marco and Marco. If you look at a full table of declensions in your grammar, you will see that they all have duplicates. For example, in the first declension, 
The singular genitive and dative and the plural nominative are identical. The fourth and fifth declensions are particularly lacking in separate parts. This lack of separate parts, or these duplicates, can be confusing. But there are two ways of dealing with any confusion. The first, and the most important, is to learn the declensions thoroughly. There is much in Latin that does not need to be memorised. Much can be learned by coming to recognise it as you read. But the declensions must be learned. You must commit them all to memory. You must also learn how they are used so that you can recognise them in a text. The, the second way of dealing with the confusion is to understand why there are duplicate forms. The grammar of classical Latin must be seen as a snapshot of the language taken at a particular time in its development. Classical Latin is a standardisation of the speech of the educated classes during the century or so before the birth of Jesus Christ. Compared with Old Latin, or with its immediate parent Italic, or with its remote ancestor Proto-Indo-European, it has lost a lot of grammar. It has lost several tenses and most of its participles. Its declensions are also in a state of gathering collapse. By about uh, 200 AD, it will have lost several of its cases, the genitive, I think, and the dative. Long before it evolves into its daughter languages, Italian, French, Spanish, and so forth, it will have lost all its cases but the nominative, by which time relationships between words will be expressed, as in English, by using prepositions with more or less unchanging words, and by a fixed or semi-fixed order of words. To see what has been lost, look at the declension Marcus as it would have appeared around 250 BC, before Latin was taken in hand by the Roman educated classes and made into a classical language coordinate with Greek. Marcos, again, a masculine noun of the second declension. Nominative, Marcos. Vocative, Marque. Accusative, Marcom. Genitive, Marci. Dative, Marco. Not much change here. You can see that O has become U. Marcos in Old Latin has become Marcus in Classical Latin. I, I don't think that in rapid colloquial speech you'd have heard any difference. It, this is largely, I'm sure, a, a matter of spelling. Uh, but look at the ablative, Marcod. Here you have a separate form for the ablative. Again, I have no doubt that in rapid colloquial speech you might not have noticed a difference between Marco and Marcod, that they might have sounded identical. But in careful speech, and particularly in writing, there was a difference. You could tell whether a noun was being used in the dative or the ablative case. Indeed, with some reservations, let me add the locative case, marque. Perhaps you might want to say, I am with Marcus, in which case you might say, sum marque. On the other hand, you can't do that. A locative case governs um, places, not people. That being said, I've added it simply because I hope because you found this video useful. There. If you have, please check out my other Latin videos. You may also wish to check out my Classics Teaching website, www.classicstuition.co.uk. Many thanks.